Welcome to the MSJC Internet Authoring Videocast. In this video, you'll be learning about user-generated content on the Internet. The objectives for Session 5.1 are to understand push and pull communications, learn about Web 2.0, examine email-based communication, understand how to get information from news feeds, explore the technology used in podcasting, and use a mashup site. In Module 1, you learn to use search engines and links to find information and visit websites. Using the web this way is similar to how you might obtain information at a library. Action is required on your part to obtain the information you need from the source you choose. In this scenario, the source is the World Wide Web. You take actions to find sites, review them, and use your web browser to create bookmarks so you can revisit those sites. Websites are usually static, with updates being posted by developers on a regular basis. It is a good idea to revisit websites and check on updates to ensure that the information you are retrieving is current. However, the Internet continues to evolve and change with the needs of its users. Today's Internet allows you to identify the content that you want and have it sent to you at your request and possibly on a chosen schedule. You can group the modern Internet's many communication methods into two basic categories of technologies, push and pull. Some communication methods use pull technology. It's called pull because subscribers pull content to their devices when they want it. Examples of this type of technology include mailing lists, news groups, feeds, podcasts, and mashups. The other communication method, the push technology, sends content to users who request it. Examples of push communications are instant messaging, online social networks, photo and video sharing sites, and blogs. Some communication methods are both push and pull, depending on who is using them. For example, the person who writes a blog is pushing content to other users who can then decide whether they want to pull it to their devices for viewing it or not. There are several communication methods that don't fit into these neat categories. Instead, they are based on the technology they use to disseminate information or the way information is combined. As more users create information on the web, this process of pulling and pushing content has created a new way of interacting with the Internet. We'll start by looking at pull technologies. On your screen, you see the group of pull technologies of news groups, feeds, mashups, mailing lists, and podcasts. A news group is a discussion group that occurs over a computer network with many users contributing to a specific topic. The Internet has thousands of news groups on many different topics. News groups generally use the Network News Transfer Protocol, or NNTP. A feed sends subscribed users frequently updated content on a schedule that the user specifies. A feed might include news topics, blogs, updates, or podcasts. A mashup is a website that combines the data and functionality from different web resources to create a new website that is updated by those resources. A mailing list is a list of names and email addresses for a group of people who share a common interest in a specific or broad topic and exchange information by subscribing to the list. The Internet has thousands of mailing lists on many different topics. A podcast is an audio or video broadcast that is created and saved in a digital format and then stored on a computer or server. Users can subscribe to a podcast to receive it on a specific schedule and listen to it at their leisure. Podcast systems use compression and streaming technologies to transport their media. In order to better understand these technologies, you first need to understand the iterations of the web. Web 1.0 and 2.0 refer to the eras in the history of the World Wide Web as it evolved through various technologies and formats. 
Web 1.0 refers roughly to the period from 1991 to 2004, where most sites consisted of static pages and the vast majority of users were consumers, not producers, of content. Web 2.0 is based around the idea of the web as a platform and centers on user-created content uploaded to forums, social media and networking services, blogs, and wikis, among other services. Web 2.0 is a term that was coined to describe the way that users interact with Internet content. It caters to users who actively participate in writing the content that they are viewing, hence the term user-generated content. Users interact with the content and are given new and easy ways to create it. This term indicates a change in the way that people use the web. A virtual community called an online social network provides a way for people to discuss issues and share information through networks. While we're talking about web iterations, I thought I'd introduce you to the fact that there are a couple of iterations coming down the pipeline, Web 3.0 and Web 3. So the semantic web, sometimes known as Web 3.0, and not to be confused with Web 3, is an extension of the World Wide Web through standards set by the World Wide Web Consortium, the W3C. The goal of the semantic web is to make internet data machine readable. Web 3 is distinct from Tim Berners-Lee 1999 concept for a semantic web and instead is a reference to the web's adaptation of blockchain contexts. The term web 3 was coined by Polkadot founder and Ethereum co-founder Gavin Wood in 2014 referring to a decentralized online ecosystem based on blockchain. In 2021, the idea of Web3 gained popularity. Particular interest spiked towards the end of 2021, largely due to the interest from cryptocurrency enthusiasts and investments from high-profile technologists and companies. Executives from venture capital firms and Dreesen Horowitz traveled to Washington, D.C. in October of 2021 to lobby for the idea as a potential solution to questions about regulation of the web with which policymakers have been grappling. Some writers referring to the decentralized concept, usually known as Web 3, have used the term Web 3.0, leading to some confusion between the two concepts. Furthermore, some visions of Web 3 also incorporate ideas relating to the semantic web. Others, such as Elon Musk and Jack Dorsey, have argued that Web 3 only serves as a buzzword or a marketing term. Email-based communication. In Module 2, you learned how to use email to communicate with people over the Internet. You can also use your email account to subscribe to online newsletters, blogs, news sources, organizations, and other entities. For example, you might want to receive newsletters from your gym or updates regarding your major. You obtain a subscription when you subscribe to newsletters and other communications using your email address. Once you are subscribed to an online entity, information is sent to your email address on a set schedule. Typically, subscription services allow you to determine the schedule that works best for you. For example, you might choose to receive updates on which campus events are happening every month. A subscription to a retail store might result in coupons or sale alerts being sent to your email address. Subscription services are required to provide an opt-out choice so that you can unsubscribe whenever you want. Another email-based communication is the Usenet News Service, or Usenet, which was founded in 1979 at Duke University as a way of collecting information and storing it by topic or category. Usenet was one of the first large distributed information databases in the world. A distributed database is stored in multiple physical locations with portions of the database replicated at these locations. The original Usenet news service was devoted to transmitting computing news 
and facilitating discussions among employees of university computing departments regarding topics such as operating systems and programming languages. The topic categories on Usenet originally were called news groups or forums. Many people still use these terms when referring to Usenet categories, but another popular term is Internet Discussion Group. Most of these news groups are available to the general public. However, some are limited to users at a specific site or to those affiliated with a particular organization. The server that stores a news group is called a news server. The collection of news servers connected to the Internet make up Usenet. Organizations that operate news servers include most ISPs, universities, large businesses, government agencies, and other entities connected to the Internet. A news group stores items on a server as articles or postings, which are sorted by topic. Users pull the content they need to their devices in the form of articles posted to the news group. Users can simply read these articles, or they can reply to them. When the Usenet News Service began operating in 1979, the only way to read or post articles to news groups was to install and run a software program called a news reader, which could manage and display the content. Now, many email apps include features that manage the articles. You can easily search and read news group articles by using a website that archives them, such as the Google Groups directory. Google Groups stores millions of news group articles dating from 1981 in its database, creating a historical archive of communication. People use Google Groups to organize communications for their own groups, such as sports leagues, study forums, or project teams. To create a group, visit the Google Groups homepage at groups.google.com. Click the Create button and then follow the on-screen steps to create your new group. On your screen is an example of the Google Groups page. You can see on the left there is the button for creating new groups. And then in the middle of the screen, you'll see the group that I created for the Internet authoring students. Getting information from feeds. Usenet is just one example of a news feed, also called a feed or a web feed, that uses pull technology to deliver quickly changing content to users. This changing content might be received from a blog, a website, a social network, or a news organization. As you learned in Module 1, the format that is used to syndicate, distribute, published content from one site to another is called Really Simple Syndication, or RSS for short. Atom is another popular format or protocol. Both RSS and Atom make it possible for computers to share updates. Feeds are similar to news groups in that they let you subscribe to the content that you want to receive on your device. However, feeds differ from news groups because of the way that the content is provided to subscribers. News group postings are delivered via email messages, whereas feeds are sent through a program that includes a summary and a link to the published or actual content, depending on how you choose to receive it. Feeds are also used by organizations and individuals that create and maintain blogs and on social networking sites as a way to publish content and alert subscribers to changes in the content. As you learned in Module 4, to receive feed content, you can install a program called an aggregator on your device. An aggregator requests content from feeds to which you have subscribed and displays the content in a format similar to an email message. Most web browsers, email apps, and social networking sites have built-in aggregators that let you subscribe to, view, and remove feeds. Typically, websites that syndicate content also include built-in aggregators that you can use to search for, subscribe to, and view syndicated content using any web browser. 
To subscribe to a feed that you are interested in, you can use a feed directory to find a source. However, a more common method is to use the tools provided on the website where the feed resides. Websites that include feeds will display a small orange RSS or Atom icon. You can click to subscribe to the feed or use a provided sign-up box to enter your email address. Sometimes the link to subscribe to feeds is a text link with the letters RSS to indicate the file format of the syndicated content. The image on your screen shows a page from the Library of Congress's website using the URL loc.gov forward slash subscribe. On this page, you can subscribe to the feeds that are based on categories or topics. Notice that you can view the feed content on the website without having to subscribe to it. However, you will not receive updated content automatically without a subscription. Feeds are used by organizations and individuals that create and maintain blogs and on social networking sites as a way to publish content and alert subscribers to changes in the content. To receive feed content, you install an aggregator on your device and you subscribe to the feed. Most web browsers, email programs, and social networking sites have built-in aggregators that let you subscribe to, view, and remove feeds. Podcasting is a type of feed that lets users subscribe to an audio or video feed, then listen to it or watch it at the user's convenience on a compatible device. The software to subscribe to a podcast is called a podcatcher. It manages the schedule for downloading files to your device. Some examples of podcatchers include Radio Public, Player FM, Pocket Casts, and Spotify. Mashups are a software program that uses an application programming interface, or API, to communicate with an operating system or some other program. An API is just a set of tools and protocols used by developers to build applications or apps that can be implemented without jeopardizing the program's interface. APIs allow developers to reduce the amount of coding needed for third-party programs and ensure that the software works well together. An API is written with a specific goal in mind, reduces the amount of coding for third-party software programs, might be written by a company that makes the API available to any developer who wants to use it, usually for free. The term web services describes the process of organizations communicating through a network to share data without needing extensive knowledge of each other's systems. In a mashup, a developer combines the services from two or more different sites using APIs to create a completely new site that uses features from each site. Generally, targeted advertising generates revenue for the mashup site. Amazon, Google Fit, and eBay are examples of websites that offer API access to their content and services via Software Developer Kits, or SDKs. Some example mashups that have restaurant reviews include Zomato.com, TripAdvisor.com forward slash restaurants, and Zagat.com. To learn more about APIs, see ProgrammableWeb.com. Our Session 5.2 objectives are to explore different methods of online messaging, examine online social and business networks, learn about photo and video sharing sites, learn about blogs and microblogs, understand how social hubs work, and learn about online reputation management. On your screen is a group of push technologies, chat, photo and video sharing, instant messaging, blogs, microblogs, and social networks. So a chat is a general term for the real-time communication that occurs over the internet using a website or a chat program. Chats can include text, voice, or video, depending on the type of chat and the equipment used. A photo sharing site and a video sharing site let users create accounts into which they can upload photos or videos so that other users can view them. These sites are geared towards communities of users. 
An instant message is sent in real time between users who are chatting over a network and using network connected devices. Instant messaging usually occurs over an internet connection or a cellular network using mobile devices. A blog is a frequently updated website that expresses the opinions of the author or authors with content that is focused on a specific topic or a category of information. A microblog is a form of blogging in which users send short messages on a very frequent schedule. And a social network is a general term that refers to any community of people who use the internet to share information, which might include updates, business information, contacts, photos, videos, or links to other users or sites. Some of these push communication methods are older and are used less frequently as new technologies take their place, but their history is important to understanding the evolution of internet messaging. Originally, the term chat described the act of users talking to each other by exchanging typed character-based messages. The early networks that became the internet included many computers that ran a program called Talk, which allowed users to exchange short text messages. In 1988, Jarko Okaranen wrote a communications program that extended the capabilities of the talk program for his employer, the University of Ulu in Finland. He called his multi-user program Internet Relay Chat, or IRC. By 1991, IRC was running on more than 100 servers throughout the world. IRC became popular among scientists and academics for conducting informal discussions about experiments and theories with colleagues at other universities and research institutes. IRC is still used around the world today. In addition to text-only chats, people in the 1990s used their web browsers to visit chat rooms in which they could send text-only messages to other users in the room or just read the messages without contributing to the discussion. Today, chat is a generic term for instant messaging, which includes sending text, pictures, and videos through text messaging on Internet devices and talking to other users by enabling the camera and microphone on the Internet device without requiring the use of a telephone line. Chat can involve exchanging pictures, videos, audio, data, and programs using a variety of technologies and methods. Some messaging apps allow you to give control to your device to a customer service or technical support person to troubleshoot any problems you are having. You can also use chat to collaborate in real time when working on shared documents with users at different locations. Most devices provide voice chat in which participants speak to each other in real time, much like they would using a telephone, but without needing a telephone line. The addition of a compatible camera, also called a webcam, enables users to participate in a video chat called FaceTime on Apple devices in which participants can see and speak to each other. Many chat apps let users interact with each other while playing online games with other users. The practice of reading messages and not contributing to the discussion is called lurking. Different types of apps can be used to send and receive messages. The app you choose and the type of conversation you have, text, voice, or video, might depend primarily on the devices that you use your internet connection, and what you plan to discuss. Some chats require special software and a connection to a specific server. The first instant messaging program, I Seek You, started in 1996 and still has millions of worldwide users. Within six months of I Seek You's introduction, America Online, AOL, created its own instant messaging software called AOL Instant Messenger or AIM. AOL originally created AIM to allow its members to chat with each other, but it subsequently made the software available to anyone, even people without AOL accounts, for use on the web. Soon, Microsoft introduced MSN Messenger, later to become Windows Live Messenger, and now replaced by Skype. Yahoo Messenger 
and other sites released their own products to capitalize on the continuing popularity of instant messaging. Instant messaging is now widely available with built-in support on many websites and devices, including tablets and smartphones. Some people use the term I aming, spelled I-M-I-N-G, when using instant messaging. I am is also used as a verb, as in to I am a friend. As social networks began including an instant messaging feature, the need for users to have compatible operating systems and devices has waned. However, some instant messaging services require users to install an app, so make sure to select the version that will work with your particular device. Most instant messaging apps can access the contact list on your device or on a social network account so you can begin messaging other people immediately. Some instant messaging apps include features that make it possible to see when other users are online, to post your status to indicate when you are unavailable, to let others know when you have read their messages, and to indicate when the other person is responding so you know to wait for an incoming response. These features make it easy to let others know whether you have the time to talk, which gives you some control over your availability for conversations. I am is now widely available, has built-in support on many social networking sites and other types of websites, and for many types of devices, including computers and cell phones. A text message is another type of instant message that takes place between people who are connected to a network using smartphones and other internet devices. It usually requires an account with a cellular carrier and a subscription to a text messaging plan. It also lets users send and receive very short messages, usually 140 characters or less, in real time. VOIP is an acronym for Voice Over Internet Protocol. It's an alternative to traditional landline telephone service provided by residential and commercial phone companies. Because VOIP uses the Internet as its network instead of the physical communication structure required by landlines, it can eliminate monthly service fees and taxes and usually includes long-distance and international calling for free or for a nominal charge. Most VOIP providers include calling features that you'd expect from landlines, such as caller ID, call forwarding, call waiting, and voicemail services. If your landline is provided by your cable provider, you might already be using Voice over IP for your telephone service. For business customers, Voice over IP is a way to reduce costs by routing voice conversations over existing internet networks, while at the same time providing other services, such as faxing, conference calls, and web conferencing. Some popular voice over IP options for business customers are Ring Central, UMA for business, and Vonage. Several voice over IP providers also market other services, such as teleconferencing, transcribed voicemail messages that are emailed to recipients, and residential plans. The primary disadvantage of voice over IP is its limitations in identifying a caller's physical location for emergency services, such as 911 operators, because voice over IP uses an IP address instead of a physical location to identify a call's origin. Voice over IP providers use an enhanced 911 service to transmit all 911 calls from their subscribers to the appropriate emergency services provider along with the caller's telephone number and a physical address provided upon initiation of the voice over IP service. This process is slower than what you expect when making an emergency call from a traditional landline. In the past, social networks worked to connect people with specific common interests. For example, one of the first social networks, classmates.com, started in 1995 as a way to connect people from specific graduating classes at high schools, colleges, and in the military. Another early online social network, Craigslist, which was created in 1995 by Craig Newmark, started as an information resource for San Francisco area residents. This online community was later expanded to include information for most major cities in the United States and in countries around the world. 
The company started out as a not-for-profit organization, but was incorporated as a for-profit company in 1999. According to the site's fact sheet, Craigslist retains its .org domain as a way to symbolize the relatively non-commercial na nature of the service and its non-corporate culture. This mission is evident in the site's very basic design and function. Craigslist.org was an early pioneer and it is still operated as a community service. Most of the revenue earned by Craigslist comes from the approximately 1 million job postings it features each month and broker department listings. According to Craigslist, its site gets more than 50 billion page views by more than 60 million people each month on 700 Craigslist sites in 70 countries around the world. These early networks included technology and features that connected people in various ways, and they are still around today. However, as technology has changed, so did social networks. Another early social network, Friendster, was launched by Jonathan Abrams in 2003 and was an immediate sensation on the web. In the same year, Google saw the advertising potential for the online social network and offered Abrams a $30 million buyout, which Abrams turned down in favor of obtaining venture capital from another source. In 2011, Google launched its own social network, Google+, which is integrated with a user's Gmail account and other Google services. Members used Friendster to post profiles with information about themselves and upload their photos and videos. They could use the site to ask friends who are already members to link to their profiles so that they could interact with each other by chatting and sharing pictures and other information. Members could also invite their non-member friends to become Friendster members which is one reason that the site grew so rapidly at first. At one point, Friendster had more than 120 million users. But as other social networking sites came online and provided new and more interactive features, its popularity rapidly declined. By 2011, Friendster's membership was fewer than 1 million members, and it had moved its headquarters to Asia, where most of those members were located. In addition, the company discontinued its social networking feature and changed its focus to social gaming. It discontinued its gaming site in 2015. Other social networking sites that use the same technology as Friendster have been widely successful. Facebook, which began in 2004 as a closed network for college students and later was expanded to include high school students, was founded by Mark Zuckerberg, then a student at Harvard University. After gaining new members at a rate of three times faster than its competitors, the Facebook network was open to anyone age 13 and older with an email address. Not all social media has the same success as Facebook. Many social networks operate in niche markets, such as networks for people speaking specific languages or living in specific geographic areas, people with certain hobbies and other interests, people of the same religious preference, and people who share other common characteristics, much like you would find in traditional peer groups. Most of these sites provide a directory that lists members, locations, and interests. On some sites, a member can offer to communicate with any other member, but the communication does not occur until the intended recipient approves the contact, usually after reviewing the sender's information. By gradually building up a set of connections, members can develop contacts within a community. Some of these social networking sites have proven track records for recreating, on a much larger scale, the essence of the original Internet communities. Nearly all social networking sites rely heavily on advertising to generate the revenue that they need to operate. Successful social networks not only cater to members' needs, but also have an open mind with regard to advertising and creativity. Many businesses use social networks to advertise their goods and services, and then partner with a site such as Etsy or eBay for sales. Through their own friend connections, they can establish a marketing channel that grows as they gain exposure using the social connections of their friends and customers. 
Many businesses incorporate strategies offering incentives, such as discounts based on the number of page likes or for people who provide product reviews. Over time, social media has become a very efficient and cost-effective way to reach a large targeted audience. Expanding on promoting products for the first time using social networks, many music artists are now turning to social media to release and publicize their works. Singers Beyonce and Taylor Swift both successfully released singles and entire albums using their social networks, bypassing the industry's traditional marketing methods of promotion. Social media has also provided a powerful marketing outlet for many aspiring artists who can leverage their online fan base to promote and sell their material. Facebook is an extremely attractive site for advertisers because of its large number of active users, 1.5 billion users and counting, and more than 65% of its users check their Facebook pages daily. Now the largest social network in the world, Facebook has become an essential communication tool for individuals and a valuable marketing tool for corporations. Even something as commonplace as a bottle of mustard has a Facebook page. Political candidates, grassroots campaigns, television programs, and millions of businesses in 70 countries have Facebook pages that are integral parts of their communication and marketing efforts. In 2012, Facebook became a publicly traded company, and in 2016, it was valued at more than $320 billion, $100 billion more than Walmart. Online business networks are usually not looking to build social connections with other people. Users of online business networks are looking for specific business solutions, such as a company recruiting employees with a specific skill, a vendor hoping to place its products in a particular retail outlet, or an organization searching for a consultant who can provide assistance on a specific topic. Some examples of online business networks would be LinkedIn, a social network for business professionals that started in 2003, has more than 414 million individual members who use the site to make connections to other professionals and companies in over 200 countries and territories. More than three trillion companies around the world use the site to connect with professionals, professional networks, and other businesses as a recruiting and marketing tool. LinkedIn is just one of many sites that focus primarily on professional networking, but it is the largest. Other business network sites, such as Yammer, a private social network with 200,000 company members, and Sermo, a site that is restricted to credentialed physicians that has more than 550,000 members worldwide are smaller but still connect business professionals. Users of online business networks are typically seeking jobs, searching for potential business partners, recruiting workers, joining professional networks, exchanging ideas, and engaging in other development and career activities. Online business network users are usually not looking to build social connections with other people similar to those on social networks such as Facebook. Online business networks are used by people and organizations that are looking for specific solutions, such as a company recruiting employees with certain skills, a vendor hoping to place its products in a particular retail outlet, or an organization searching for a consultant who can provide assistance on a specific topic. Online business networks tend to use categories that reflect these specific interests and try to make it easy for business people to find the connections that they need as quickly and efficiently as possible. Almost all devices now include features that allow users to take high-resolution images and videos. Because of their large file sizes, many people post their files on sharing sites, not only to store them, but also to share them with others. Many sites provide free storage space to upload image and video content and features for sharing. Content can then be shared with a designated person or group of people who have similar interests. Many sites also provide features that allow for personalized purchases such as calendars, mugs, and prints using the images that you upload. Some of the first file sharing sites on the internet such as Shutterfly and Flickr are still popular and are widely used. Flickr lets users tag images by category or person and share these photos as part of their social network 
or with other social networks, such as Facebook. These sites, generally called photo sharing sites, enable people to become part of a community by uploading images and sharing them with others. Some people use photo sharing sites just to store images and back up their files. Storage websites, typically, let users post photos for free up to a certain capacity limit. These types of free sites might be supported by advertisement that targets participants based on the content of their photographs that they're uploading. Other sites impose fees for all users. Sharing photos on the web can be done privately or publicly, depending on your goal. Almost every site includes features that let you post photos and restrict who can view them by sending invitations to view your gallery or by sharing links to your collections. Some sites include features that make it possible to automatically sync your device with the site so that new images are uploaded automatically, thereby creating a backup of your images. Photo sharing sites typically include features that make it easy for you to make simple edits to your pictures, such as red eye removal, cropping, changing the brightness level, and other tasks that are available through the site's menus. Instagram is a photo sharing site that is also a social network. When choosing where to upload your photos, be sure to review the features each website includes so that you can determine which one will best serve your needs. For example, if you're planning on using your photos for prints and gift items, you might be very interested in any sales options and reduced pricing. If you need to store a lot of files, the amount of storage space might be a priority for you. Similar to photo sharing sites, where people post photos to share with others, a video sharing site lets users post video content. These videos might be short clips shot from someone's internet device or professionally produced movie trailers, news segments, or interviews. The most popular video sharing site, YouTube, started in 2005 as a private venture only a year later, Google purchased it for $1.65 billion. YouTube has more than a billion visitors posting and watching billions of videos each day. As the site became more popular and more integrated with other online social networks, corporations began sponsoring pages and uploading their own material, including commercials, corporate news, product tours, and even political ads and rallies. YouTube is now the primary place where people post and watch video content on the web. You don't need to visit the YouTube website to view its content. A growing number of companies embed links to videos that they've posted on YouTube and program those links to open a new window and a media player on your device to play the video directly from their web pages. YouTube relies heavily on display ad placement, brand channels, in contests to generate revenue. They also offer a subscription service to avoid having to view advertising in the videos you're watching. Other video sharing sites include Google Videos and Bing Videos. A blog is a website that is published to express the blogger's opinions about a particular topic. Some blogs function much like news organizations by disseminating information about a specific story or from a specific organization. A blog might contain only text and comments, but it usually includes photographs, links, videos, and other content, and lets readers integrate the blog content that they're viewing into their own social network. Many blogs are published using free blogging tools available from the sites such as Blogger, WordPress, and Tumblr. Blogging tools often include templates that format the blog's content and then provide the blog's overall design. They also have you create forms to post comments, create widgets of tools to post the content on other sites, and provide code snippets to create hyperlinks and embed photos in the postings. Like websites, a blog might display inaccurate or inappropriate information. Always evaluate a blog for the resources it contains and the credentials of its author. A blog written by an individual usually always expresses the author's opinion. A microblog is a form of blogging that sends short messages, usually 140 characters or less, on a very frequent schedule. Microblog postings are sometimes called tweets. The act of microblogging is sometimes called tweeting. 
A follower is a person who is receiving the microblog updates. The act of reposting another user's comments on your account is called retweeting. And when hashtags are repeated in messages at an escalating rate, they connect users to spread information quickly, which in turn creates a trending topic. Many microbloggers use the same text message acronyms that you find in instant messages. Users include user-defined keywords called hashtags to create topical categories that link to other messages with the same hashtags. To post content using a microblog, such as Twitter, you need to create an account. Microblogs have gained popularity beyond the online personal journal and are now widely used for a variety of purposes, such as retailers to communicate with their customers, educational organizations to communicate with their students, and actors to communicate with their fans. Consolidating content using a social hub. A social hub is a visually appealing and very useful command center that provides information about a brand, idea, or organization. Social hubs can be used to assimilate all of the content of a specific topic to engage readers and generate interest. Social hubs can also be used as an organizational tool for a specific topic. Combining feeds from different social networks and content from different sources on a single web page creates a compilation of a brand's or organization's online identity. Individuals can create a social hub as a way of integrating their own personal feeds from various sites, thus eliminating the need to check each site individually. Social and business networks can be powerful tools for keeping in touch with friends and family, communicating with business associates, or locating people around the world who share your personal and professional interests. However, the very nature of these open networks can result in problems for people who are not careful about how they use them. When creating a profile on an online social network, consider the following. There's a strong likelihood that many people in the world share your same name and maybe even some common life details. When you contact someone as a friend through the network, you might not be contacting the correct person. You might just be contacting someone with the same name. Likewise, you could be contacting someone who is pretending to be someone else. Some sites have restricted areas or prohibit use for underage users, but with millions of users, it's likely that some of them will be able to access restricted content simply by falsifying their age. Parents need to be especially diligent to monitor the use of online social networking by minors to protect their privacy and the material they view while online. In response to this and other problems associated with minors using social networking sites, some school districts in the United States have blocked access to Facebook, Twitter, and other online social networks on their school computers in an attempt to protect children from inappropriate content and internet predators. Many corporations and large organizations block their computers from accessing online social networks. Many do so for the sake of security, but some admit that the blocks occur because employees waste too much time while they're at work visiting these sites. Cyberbullying, using internet communications such as email, text, and instant messages, blogs, microblogs, or social networks to harass, threaten, or intimidate someone, is a problem usually associated with children, but can involve adults as well. Most social networks have codes of conduct that establish penalties for this type of behavior, which should be reported immediately. In addition, a site's help section usually outlines the steps that you can take to prevent cyber bullies from contacting you again and to report them to the network's administration. Because the nature of a social network requires you to provide real information about yourself, your name, hometown, education, birth date, picture, and other personal information, and because the information you provide by design is made public, you might be putting yourself at risk for identity theft or other privacy problems. Most sites include tools that let you hide parts of your profile from other users until you give them permission to access your complete profile. Be sure to read the site's privacy policy 
and change the default security settings as necessary to protect your privacy in a way that makes you feel comfortable and secure when using the site. However, keep in mind that the contacts you have on these social networks have access to your information and so do all of their contacts. A member with 20 contacts might feel comfortable sharing personal information with those 20 contacts, but must be mindful of the fact that each of those 20 contacts can share the information with their contacts, some of whom are strangers to the member. In addition to protecting your privacy and identity, it's important to protect your reputation and control the information that you make available to the public. The information that you post on a social network is public, and it is often archived even after you delete it. Many employers check Twitter, Facebook, and other online social networks for information that you have posted about yourself. Applicants with exemplary resumes are often passed over for interviews when their Twitter accounts or Facebook pages show them acting in ways that are inappropriate according to an organization's corporate culture. Schools are especially careful to monitor online sites. Most parents would demand action from school districts if they found that their child's teacher was participating in inappropriate online behavior, even if that behavior was on his or her own time. Some universities have policies that prevent student-athletes from creating profiles on Facebook or other sites. Although the reasons for these bans vary, one stated reason is to protect the privacy of the athlete, some of whom travel significantly as part of their involvement in student athletic programs. Another stated reason is to protect the reputation of the school. Some universities view student-athletes as ambassadors of the university and having athletes involved in inappropriate behavior documented on their online profiles could result in an embarrassment to the school and other athletes. Another issue related to privacy is the use of your online profile by people in positions of authority. On several college campuses across the United States, students' online profiles provided proof that they violated the code of conduct agreements that they signed when they became tenants of student housing. In one case, students of North Carolina State University took pictures of themselves in a dorm room while consuming alcohol. One of the students posted pictures of the party on his Facebook page. When a university official found the pictures, they became proof of the violation to the student housing contract and proof of the student's underage drinking. In similar cases on other college campuses, the students were suspended. At some schools, students regarded this lurking by university officials and online sites as an invasion of privacy. Other schools have updated their codes of conduct to specifically authorize the monitoring of students' online profiles as a legal way of taking action against a student when inappropriate or illegal behavior is proven with information students post on their profiles. Unfortunately, sometimes the online content that is posted about a specific person or a business might not be true, resulting in damage to his or her online reputation. Or the information might be true and cause problems with job applications or required background screenings for different reasons. When the information posted is not true, you might need to employ the services of a reputation management firm to help remove it. These types of businesses are becoming so prevalent and necessary that they have been categorized as Online Reputation Management Services, or ORMs. ORMs help people and organizations to monitor their online reputation and, when necessary, work to clear any offensive or negative content from social networks, blogs, and other sites. Reputation Defender at reputationdefender.com is a product of one such company, that specializes in online reputation management. Other providers that you might explore to learn more about ORM are reputation.com and brandyourself.com. And that's it for this lecture. Enjoy generating your content online, but be careful. If you like this video, please click the like button and leave us a comment down below. I also would appreciate it if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also click the notification bell so that you'll be notified when new videos are posted.